Good day to you, Guyana, and welcome to another edition, the first edition of Facing the Nation for the year 2018. I know it's almost the end of January, but I still take this opportunity to say um, a very happy new year, a happy and productive 2018 to you from the Facing the Nation family. Of course, unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, we were slated to return last Friday, but because of some technical difficulties, which is now uh, started, we're back with you, so we're beginning one week later. And it is my pleasure to begin our program for this year by focusing on local government. Now, the, the local government system and how important it is to us, uh, to us as a people and to our society. I know you've gotten used to having the program split into where we have two guests, but because I felt this topic was important enough, and you just hear people saying local government, local government elections, local government system, because I felt that this topic was important enough today, we're going to have one guest, so we're going to have um, not at all a brief discussion on the local government. And it is my pleasure to welcome to Facing the Nation for the first time, Mr. Vincent Alexander, who of course is no stranger to Guyana. He's a GCOM commissioner, and he's also referred to as a local government um, specialist because because he's been doing some training and you hear all about that from him but it's my pleasure to welcome him to the program so welcome mr vincent alexander thank you very much Blake. all right thank you so very much for being here well let's jump right into it because again we were to start last week and we would have started with mr alexander but we're so happy that he took the time to um schedule for us and come back this week first off mr alexander as we're talking um local government systems and local government elections one of the big things we heard in the news last week and even the week before was that within the apnu afc government apnu afc administration there was some back and forth as to whether the afc will go it alone or the apnu will go it alone for local government elections which are due at the end of this year i'd like you to talk about that first of all how do you feel? Is it wise for there to be a, for want of a better word, split now as it relates to local government election, or, or should they go it as a unit? Well, I, I wouldn't say there's a split. I wouldn't refer to it that way at all. They're two separate parties. Okay. And I think they reserve the sovereign right to do it the way individually they wish uh, to do it. Mm -hmm. The consequences are not the same oh. as would be for national elections. Mm -hmm. For national elections, the party with the plurality, with the highest percentage of votes, gets the presidency and gets the government. There's no such thing in the government elections. Hmm. Government elections is a coming together of councillors, and in that council, they then make a decision about the chairperson. So going it separately does not mean that they may not cooperate hmm. in terms of the work in the council. So it, 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 it's not the same scenario, and uh, it's a reserve right, I would think. However, I am of a different opinion. Okay. Totally. <laughs> and that is that really political parties should stay away uh, from local government elections. Hmm. Um, we know Guyana. We know the kind of divide. Mm -hmm. And we know how everything becomes absorbed in the politics. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when that happens, the issues of development and people's welfare suffer at the expense of the political rivalry. Uh, local government provides the opportunity for communities to pick citizens who they think can best serve them and who may have had a track, a track record of serving them through non-governmental involvement mm -hmm. to come together to give leadership to local development. And local development does not entail some of the political issues that national development entails. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier for people across political lines to cooperate and to collaborate locally for things local that affect them all. It's not a sharing out of, of um, anything at, lo at a local level. It's a coming together to benefit uh, the community. And so in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. I'm an advocate for a constituency system mm -hmm. that allows for the ability to participate. The law may not exclude political parties, but if I had to express an opinion on the matter, I think we'd be better off if the parties stayed away. And in fact, this is not unprecedented, because if I can recall clearly, in the local government election of 1994, mm -hmm. the then People's National Congress reform, 
did not participate in the elections for the neighborhood democratic councils. They only participate in the elections, in the elections. for the municipalities. Okay. And I may well argue that that is that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm firmly of the view that at the level of the NDCs, the party should let the people should do let the thing. people do thing. All right, I I'm, I appreciate that opinion, and I'm sure that our, our viewers would appreciate that opinion too. To play an advocate of uh, against what you're saying, um, what would you say to, y especially young people who don't fully understand the local government system yet, who may argue, well, maybe the political, the actual political parties are more experienced in terms of political work, and that is why they should be a part of. The well, I'll say two things to that. Okay. I would prefer not to refer to local government as political work. As, oh. I prefer to refer to it as community work, as mm. developmental work. And so, mm -hmm. don't think that the politicians have monopoly okay. on what <laughs> is to be done. Secondly, we have to remember that in some regards, with the present citizenry, the whole government is new. Yes. We had elections in 1970. We had in 1994, and now we're having in 2000, and we had in 2016. So that we have had a large number, greater part of our population, who have no local government experience. And therefore, that also kills the argument about the political parties being better off. Because the people who make those parties were not involved in local government for these periods I've mm -hmm. talked about. So it's relatively new. And so it lends to people now coming on board, mm -hmm. and it lends to people who are not necessarily political um, being involved as to well. To look at it from the other side, though, again, I, I know you're right. Your opinion is that it should not be politicized. Um, local government um, elections um, should not really be politicized. But to go on the other side of it, do you feel, though, that it's maybe a springboard, a stepping stone, preparing especially young people who may become in involved in local government elections and the local government system. Is it, a, it, it could it prepare them for national politics? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. It has been argued universally uh -huh. that in fact local government is the preparation ground for people who want to enter national politics. Okay. Now you don't have necessarily have to prepare by being in a party. Okay. have to prepare by doing the things that representatives of people do. That's interact with people, represent their interests, give them leadership. That training in itself prepares you for national politics and for party politics. Mm -hmm. So that yes, I agree that local government can prepare people and it's almost universally accepted that local government does that. Okay. But it doesn't mean you have to do it through a party. Mm -hmm. And we have the history here. Uh, Borden was a mayor. Hmm. of Georgetown. He participated in the local government elections. Some and there are a lot of other of our politicians of the past era who also participated in local government, in local government and then went on to participate in national politics. Okay. All right. As we're on the note of springboard and stepping stone and preparing for national politics, let's talk about some of the work that you have been doing in terms of especially pre probably preparing young persons and people who are strange to local government elections. Let's talk about the work that you've been doing in terms of training for them. Well, I have over the years, and, and it goes back to even when we didn't have elections, mm -hmm. uh, done work in communities through various projects. Mm -hmm. And what we seek to do is, first of all, to explain what local government is, is all about. We seek to explain how people can become involved in local government. And then we seek to do and seek to explain when they become involved what they can actually do for their communities. And I have done this at various levels. I've done this in communities. But I've also done this with some youth organizations. Like, and, and I've done it on behalf of youth organizations as well uh, to go and to speak to youth groups yes. and things like that to bring them aware. I've even gone as far as to go to churches. Oh. Because that's a very captive audience. 
What do you? I, I'm happy that you said captive audience because I, I'm thinking what would be the res, what the response would be like. Because again, even though you're saying that it shouldn't local government elections shouldn't be so much about the politics, I'm thinking in terms of churches. They're thinking politics. But people, I'm not talking to the church. <laughs> I'm talking to the people sitting in those pews as individuals. Mm. The audience. The church provides the audience. But my, I'm not addressing the church and asking the church to be involved to in the take involved. action. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the opportunity where there's a captive audience mm -hmm. to speak to that captive audience because all of them have civic responsibilities as citizens. Yeah. And therefore, the line I carry in such a presentation is on one hand, educational, to provide information. But on the other hand, to appeal to them to exercise their civic responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What sort of feedback you get from, and this is not only in the churches, but young people on the whole who are still iffy well i don't know what is in it for me why should i get involved in anything that you know again that you don't benefit immediately from directly the first thing i get in terms of response is people saying i didn't know all of this ah. i didn't know about the government i didn't know what it means i didn't know what the possibilities mm -hmm. are you get that and what is in it for me is an interesting question because I think one of the problems we face with nationally is people don't necessarily see politics, involvement in governance as a civic responsibility. They see it as an opportunity uh -huh. for them to add to their daily bread. Mm -hmm. And that is so dangerous. Hmm. It is so dangerous. So that um, some people do come away interested, but they still come away asking the question, what am I going to get out get of this? Get out of it, yes. You know, I remember years ago, I went to Blackbush Border mm -hmm. and had a conversation there. I think this was after the 94 elections. Had a conversation there with the councillors. Two to three months after the elections, half the council had already left. They envisaged that becoming councillors meant they were going to have a lot of resources at their disposal mm -hmm. and they were going to be able to benefit personally from what was, what was happening. Uh, local government, in a sense, has to be seen as service rather than as a job. True, you may get a stipend to help with things like your transportation and things like that, but I think we have to go back to the spirit of volunteerism in things like local government at the level of the council. You have professional officers who are there to do the professional job. The councils are there not to get involved in the administration, mm. but to get involved in policy determination, to get involved in monitoring, to get involved in representing the constituencies from which they were elected. And that really is a civic responsibility more than anything else. And I think a lot of work has got to be done in Guyana to get people back to that point in time mm -hmm. where they understand. Uh, that they don't understand has something to do with the state of the middle class. The state of the middle class. When you have a comfortable middle class, it is mm. easier to get them to do these things. If you have teachers who teach, are fairly well salaried and comfortable, then they don't have to look to the afternoon time as a supplement. Yes. You can look to the afternoon time as service. If you have a public servant, and so what I'm saying is that one of the problems we have in Guyana is because of the economic state. Mm -hmm. so it's over like a domino time, effect. Understood. People don't have time for volunteerism because they still need uh, to make the extra dollar. But as the economy gets better, hopefully we'll get back to that. Bearing in mind that uh, habits uh, die. Mm -hmm. Don't die easily. Yes. So even when people get hard. back to the situation where they have a better economic circumstance, uh, the, the old habit of making more uh, has to be combated. It's not going to be automatic that because the middle class is better off mm -hmm. and the middle class will suddenly do what typical middle class people do because of the experience which we've had and the habits which we've been inculcated. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Alexander, I, I, I'm happy that you, you, you said a mouthful there, and, and one of the things that jumped out at me is the fact where you talk about the councillors basically disappeared after a while, after they figured, well, you know, n not enough is in it for me. We had a situation here in Guyana 
uh, since the last local government election. Of course, I'm not I'm not into naming names, naming and shaming on this program. But there was a young gentleman. I think he served as um, uh, uh, either councillor or, or, or deputy mayor of some sort, and people felt that you know he lost this way. In talking about councillors needing to understand that this is really a service, and also talking about training. Do you believe that specific training for councillors, mayors, and deputy mayors uh, is needed even after they would have, um, for want of a better word, propelled to those offices? Oh, certainly it is needed. Local government is not as simple as it appears to be. Mm -hmm. It has a lot to do with governance, mm -hmm. and there's a lot that one needs to know if one is to be properly involved in the practice of governance. One has to understand what is transparency, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, every time that word is used, I tend to have a different view with the people who use it. Because they use it in a very uh, common sensical way. They don't understand that transparency means the equal application of rules to people and all of that. It just means, to them, it means openness. openness uh -huh. And I see openness as another element of good governance, separate and apart from transparency. I have to understand accountability. They have to understand the ethical aspect, and this is a critical one, where you don't get involved in a conflict of interest. Right? You go in there, and it's related to what I said earlier. You go in there, you end up on the finance committee, mm -hmm. you're looking out for your family. Mm -hmm. when in fact, you're supposed to be the one who's ensuring that contracts are distributed fairly. So there's a lot to be learned if one is to understand what is involved, and if one, in, in a sense, is to get the orientation, because lack of knowledge uh, leads to people not having the correct orientation sometimes. They come with their own percep perceptions. And so it's very, very critical to have training. They must understand what's the role of the professional staff. Mm -hmm. The professional staff must understand what's the role of the council. And they must make sure that they're the kind of synergy, but they don't cross the lines, that the council don't seek to do the work of the professional staff, as happens some in, in some instances, and they think they're right, as the elected councillors. Yes. And that the professional staff don't think that they can do the work of the councillors, because they think the councillors don't know, and therefore they have to do it for them. All of those things are part of the problem that we are faced with, not having practiced local government correctly uh, for some 40-something for something years. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that in some countries um, you actually have professional courses that are conducted for the professionals and for the counselors. So the counselors themselves undertake studies in local government so that they can bring a good knowledge base the job which they required it to do. Okay, great. Viewers, if you're now tuning in, of course, today uh, my conversation is with GCOM Commissioner, Mr. Vincent Alexander, and we're talking uh, a very important topic is in the air, local government, local government system, and the local government elections. Commissioner Alexander, I would eventually want to talk about the system of itself, whether there has been improvement and so on, what we can take from that for national elections. But even before we talk about that, one of the other big things we've been talking about since 2015 is oil, the onset of oil, and you know, I I want you to give me an idea, if, if I, for want of a better term, again a crossover with the onset of oil, how the communities are expected to benefit, and, and even before the communities benefit, what changes you think are necessary for our communities to really benefit from this oil. One of the problems that Guyana has been faced with and the whole government has been faced with is the insufficiency of resources okay. for the work which they should be doing. If oil represents a significant increase in the revenue of the state, then it puts the state in a position to better finance the local government. Hmm. I'm not one of the persons who feel that local authorities can raise all the money that's required to do the work in local areas. All right. I think central government is in a much better position to raise the revenues. But the revenues the central government raise are from the citizens. Hmm. And so whether they're expended in 
by a local government or a central government, they're being expended for the same people in whose name those revenues are raised. And so I see central government mm -hmm. notwithstanding local authorities having their own revenue base. I see central government still giving to local authorities a subvention of some magnitude that can help in the work they have to do. Presently, for example, I don't think the subventions that our local authorities get and the revenue they raise can really involve any kind of capital work. Maintenance. They can do things, they can do real new things. So then, if I may interject here, because we always hear some higher authority in government saying, okay, look, for example, city council, we're not going to get involved in certain matters because there we've given them the leeway to, to operate and function. As, as, is that, are those just words? That They've given them the leeway to operate and function, meaning that they have the authority to do things. Mm. But you have a limitation in what you can do if you don't have resources. And therefore, what is required, on one hand, is for the platform for them to be able to raise more revenue. One of the problems, for example, in Georgetown is the valuation of properties. Hmm. And the, the local authority, the municipality, is dependent on the central government for the valuation of those properties. If the properties in Georgetown were taxed at the commercial value at which people sell and buy property, automatically the council would make far more revenue than they're presently doing. What's necessary to put that in place? The central government has to release to, to the local government new valuation on mm -hmm. one hand, and on the other hand, they are themselves responsible for doing the valuation. That office in the Ministry of Communities, the valuation office, are responsible. Mm -hmm. And then they have to approve the rate applied to those values for the purpose of, of taxes. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that local authorities mm -hmm. would be able, should be able, to get more resources if the state, the central government, get more resources to do the work that they ought to be doing. I'm also of the view that the local, local government is very critical in the Ghana scenario. Okay. And let me explain what I mean by that. Sure. If the central government devolves onto local authorities areas of operation that are local and give them the revenue arrangements and the fiscal arrangements to be able to do those things, then the stake in central politics becomes less because life and development is taking place locally. You can therefore, through that mechanism, diffuse the degree of tension and competition that we have that takes on an ethnic dimension hmm. for the quest of power. You know, why am I so interested in central government politics if the goods are being delivered locally? locally. Right. And the delivery of the goods locally sometimes in Guyana could well correspond with ethnic enclaves because we live to some extent in ethnic enclaves. You can go along the East Coast and you can and say this is an afro Guyanese village, this is a Indo Guyanese village. Now if you have local authorities at the level of those villages, as our constitution provides for, mm -hmm. and the resources, then people can get on with their lives and not got to be caught up in the national, the national the politics, politics and, and trying to get resources and trying to get privileges and benefits out of that when life is going on well locally uh, to use your word enclaves as you call it in in this century is that a bad thing should be we, we should we be working to eradicate that this is even without the issue of uh communities getting from um central government or not getting from central government we have to lead with reality. Hmm. These enclaves are historically, they're historically boarded, hmm. right? And so they're there. That's the reality. 
and they correspond with local arrangements. So you have to respond to reality. You raised an important question, though. There are other places where they've attempted to deal with the ethnic question mm -hmm. in certain ways. So, for example, in Malaysia, mm -hmm. what did they do? When they're creating new housing areas, they literally legislate that the persons who are going to acquire houses in those new housing areas will represent percentages of the various ethnic groups. Okay. And so you create a new community and you make it a mix, a mixed community. So you tend to eradicate that way ethnic uh, enclaves. But the fact of the matter is that if people are an ethnic group, then the peculiarities to those groups that have to be protected as human rights, people's religious persuasion, people's cultural practices, people's family affairs, because the way family affairs are conducted mm -hmm. are not homogeneous. And so even where you have that mix that I talked about, you still have to put in place mechanisms to allow people at the individual level, at the family level, and probably the community level to have their peculiarities protected once those peculiarities not infringe on the rights of others. Of others. Okay. All right. Great way of answering the question on oil. <laughs> but it, it, we understand um, where you're coming from and, and, and what should be or should not be um, central government's involvement. I want to talk about the electoral system of itself. First off, uh, forgive my ignorance on this. Have there been, from 2016 to now, have there been a new electoral system for local government elections? And do you believe that the local authorities have functioned um, effectively, are operating effectively? First of all, yes, we do have a new electoral system that we used in 2016. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2016, we had a straight first-past-the-post system mm -hmm. where parties or groups yep. participated and they got seats in keeping with the percentage of the votes that they were required. In 2016, we introduced a different system that allowed for two ways for councillors to be elected. The first way is that in each local authority, 50% of the seats were contested through constituencies. What that means is that the local areas divided into the state Georgia, for example, we have 30 um, seats. Mm -hmm. The local is divided into 15 constituencies. And what you have in those constituencies is a one-on-one -on -one contest. Individual candidates. Now, those candidates could be either an individual per se mm -hmm. or a party rep or a group rep. But they are, it's, a, it's three persons competing. Who the backers are is another problem, another question, but there's three persons competing for a seat. Mm -hmm. And and so it's, it's like the first pass the post system, the person with the highest votes gets a seat. The other 15 seats, the other half of the seats, are contested in the old PR way. Mm -hmm. You vote for a party or a group, and those seats are distributed based on the percentage of the votes that you get. Individuals can't participate in that aspect of the elections. They are restricted to the constituency aspect. They can't participate in the group aspect. Group aspect. That's different. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do have a new system, and we do have councils now where half of the councillors are specifically identified with geographical areas called constituencies. And so they should be the people's direct representatives, representatives. coming from those areas. And then you have the general councillors. Um, now, that does provide for some change in the polity okay. because it means that we now have a situation where a citizen can say, I voted for Council A, Council B, or Council C, right? And therefore, I am going to relate to that council in relation to my community. Our mm. constituency can say, our constituency can say, you're the council elected doesn't matter who voted for you, you have been elected for this constituency.